It's this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized today's event. I'd like to welcome all those who are watching this live stream now, right now, and those of you who watch it later on YouTube. This is one of over 700 programs that we've done since the pandemic started a little over two years ago here when uh, our live audiences were shut down. Um, we were bringing the same uh, authors and topics, political topics that we've been doing for almost 120 years now. Uh, but we used our equipment to live stream everything, and that turned out to be a very effective method of getting us through the pandemic here, too. So today, we have uh, two authors, the co-authors of a book called Infodemic. It's about how the governments have reacted to this pandemic um, in terms of censorship. And I think one of the ideas that they have that's very interesting is how they're using censorship as noise a different form of censorship um, to really affect the political discourse in, in countries throughout the world. So thank mm -hmm. you very much for joining us, uh, Joel Simon and uh, Robert Maney. Um, so Rob and Joel, uh, first of all, you must have had the idea and executed on it fairly quickly because this is all got, just got started two years ago and you're, you're up to date on everything. So why don't you say how you work together or both thought of it and why don't you give us an idea? Go ahead, Joel, you can start. Well, go ahead. Sure. Uh, uh, well, I mean, Rob, I, Rob and I worked together for many years at the Committee to Protect Journalists. And our job there was to defend the rights of journalists around the world. And in the course of that work we did together, we saw so many crackdowns and so many attempts by governments to suppress information in the context of the war on terror, for example, or after uh, the Arab Spring when governments, you know, understood the power of independent information. But I think Rob and I will agree, Rob will agree that we've never seen anything like what we saw in the first three to six months of the pandemic, because virtually every country around the world was suppressing speech and information about this threat to public health. Um, and different governments had different approaches and different rationales, but fundamentally, this was about governments wanting to impose their own narrative and cover up their own incompetence. And their narrative was fundamentally that this is not as bad as you think. We've got it under control. We don't need to take these extreme measures. Um, and anyone who contradicted that faced different forms of censorship and, and attempts to, to limit those expressions of speech that contradicted the official narrative. So Rob and I were sitting there looking around the world and we sort of said look everyone's understandably paying attention to the threat to public health and they're not seeing this global wave of censorship and violation of rights and we need to document that and 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 and, and tell that story and that was the origin of this book yeah and and rob i, I think we want to make it clear to the audience the censorship wasn't just against, you know, rogue doctors that are, were saying use ivermectin or, or bleach or something like that. This is, this is across the board so that, that the audience knows right away. We're talking about kind of a major across the board reaction um, by governments, just like, you know, when the Berlin Wall went down, all the governments in, in East Europe said, Does it, is, can we use this opportunity to, 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 to shift the, the narrative? And in this case, um, fascinatingly, it's some... Uh, one of their obligations as a government to take care of the health of the people, but it doesn't come off in this kind of a big issue very often. And here we have a big issue, in, uh, as you show, in many different ways and, in, and to different degrees, but almost everybody was on the same page of, <laughs> we've got we've to pretend nothing's happening or pretend we're doing a perfect job. So uh, Rob, why don't you give a big idea about, about the uh, sort of mistakes that the government's made along this line? Sure, thank you. And, and thank you for the opportunity of, of, of talking about the book. We, we, we looked at how censorship was used as a shield to protect leaders, whether they were democratic leaders or authoritarian leaders, from criticism because they did not know how to handle this virus. None of us did. 
Mm -hmm. They were ill prepared for it. Or if they had plans, like the U.S. had a, a great plan for a pandemic, it, it didn't even dust it off and implement it. Mm -hmm. So rather than deal with the disease, they dealt with the uh, speech around the disease or criticism emanating from the disease. So you mm -hmm. could take a country like China that the moment that something was, was seen to be happening in the city of Wuhan, where the, the, uh, the virus first appeared, their reaction was to shut everything down, but not just lock down the uh, city, but to shut down information from coming out. And then that information which did come out, they wanted to control it. Mm -hmm. And two years on, China is still doing the same thing, this time only with Shanghai or parts of, of, of Beijing, following the same uh, the same playbook. And in uh, democracies, what we saw was a different kind of censorship. So we're all used to censorship through silence, where you control what people can see, what they can hear, what journalists can report. You can, you can, you can ban publications, you can seize newspapers, you can shut down websites. That's the kind of censorship that we remember from the old days of um, the, uh, the Soviet Union, for example. But now we're dealing in democracies with a different kind of censorship. You can't control uh, information in that way anymore. Everybody has access to uh, the internet through mobile phones. So what you do is you flood everyone with, the, with misinformation, lies, propaganda, so that your narrative is the, the one that is uh, supreme and everything else you cast doubt on. And that's what we saw in India, we saw it in Brazil, and we saw it here in the US too, where information uh, censorship through noise is what we call it in the mm -hmm. book, mm -hmm. where, you, where you just make people doubt everything and undermine trust. Both are, uh, both are the same, uh, different sides of the same censorship coin, if you like, but it stems from the fact that governments were afraid that they would uh, lose legitimacy, lose power uh, if they didn't um, if, if they didn't handle this virus, and they couldn't handle the virus. Mm -hmm. the, the censorship through noise idea is, is a great one, and I find it, it it's very similar. It's almost like uh, what the Russians did in the 2016 election um, was give everybody a good idea about how to do this, and everyone was complaining about the Russians doing it, and then they all did it and it, it, it applied to this new factor. Um, just the idea to try to confuse people uh, uh, sufficiently so that they're distracted from what they should be paying attention to. I find that fascinating. Joel, I mean, it, it, you, your background in, in, in uh, you know, watching out for journalists throughout the world. Um, have, have any journalists been, been uh, executed as a result of this? Or is this, is this more of, of, of hasn't got r risen to that level? Journalists that, that uh, disagreed with the uh, government in any location. I'm not. Rob, Rob may be aware of uh, journalists who who faced, you know, uh, that kind of government sanctioned violence. But that really, that was a that's a very crude measure. Yeah. And certainly, we've seen that. Rob and I have seen that. You know, Jamal Khashoggi might come to mind. Yeah. Uh, people may be familiar with him, the Washington Post columnist who was uh, uh, killed by a Saudi hit squad. Uh, in, in in Turkey, mm -hmm. uh, but that's really unusual. And and governments, for the most part, used more sophisticated measures. We did see certainly journalists and 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 Rob mentioned uh, the kind of that the you know when the pandemic began in China, there was a small group of journalists there, bloggers, independent citizen journalists who sought to document uh, what was happening there. And we tell the story of one of those bloggers. His mm -hmm. name is. A Chen Chi Shi, and he was a lawyer, and he sort of reported on his own using social media in uh, Hong Kong, and then he went to Wuhan, and he, he just started documenting what he saw. He took the last train there as mm -hmm. China was shutting down uh, transportation, and he wandered around with his phone, and he you used sort of improvised, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, safety measures, you know, wearing swim goggles and mm -hmm. a mask. And, and he just went around the city documenting what was happening. And he wasn't the only blogger doing this. They were a handful. And he managed to reach through, you know, YouTube and other channels, you know, a global audience. But then the Chinese government caught up with him and they shut him down and they shut down other bloggers. And they sought to impose their own narrative, both within China and globally to tell their own story. And their own story was about how authoritarian governments are much 
more efficient and effective at controlling misinformation and, their, and marshaling state resources to address a public health emergency. And censorship spread around the world along as we document these crackdowns uh, that took place in uh, Iran and Egypt and Nicaragua and different kinds of authoritarian uh, governments that you know sought to suppress information. And then it spread to the democratic world. We tell the story of Brazil and India, and as, as Rob mentioned, uh, the US, where, where the strategy was this censorship through noise or flooding um, the, the, the information space and con confusing people. So really the, the, the st strategies that we saw, I wouldn't call them subtle, but they weren't quite as crude mm -hmm. as, mm -hmm. as, the, you know, as violence. They were really more focused on uh, using uh, state repression in some instances and this other technique of distraction and confusion in other instances. Well, let's, let's uh, stick with China for a little while before we go to the other countries, since it started there, and at least we mm -hmm. think that it did, and, and uh, their reaction is such, and you said they're still doing it uh, today. Um, I liked one of the lines you said that, that China was spent its time spent its time trying to get the censorship just right, enough censorship, enough noise, enough you know, so that they they are almost practicing. Uh, well, I mean they've been practicing for a long time. So, what did you mean by get the censorship balance just right, Rob? Well, information circulates within China. Um, Chinese social media platforms are awash in information, entertainment. The idea is uh, uh, that the, the Chinese government will only intervene to shut down uh, speech in China if it sees that there is a possibility of uh, an organizing of, of, uh, of dissidents or, or, or oppos opposition um, around a particular issue that's that's happening on social media. The moment that anything threatens the supremacy of the Communist Party of China, they will crack down on that. They have an army of human sensors, of AI, artificial intelligence sensors, and there is the the, the great firewall of China. In other words, uh, the the international internet cannot be accessed except through. Uh, uh, um, uh, means such as uh, Tor browser or, or other things mm -hmm. can take you around the firewall. So the uh, the Chinese authorities are looking at this second by second and deciding what speech they can allow and what speech they can't. They can't shut down the big Chinese social media platforms. What they can do and do do is ban the international ones, whether it's YouTube or Twitter or Facebook mm -hmm. or anywhere else where uh, Chinese citizens could have views from abroad or publish views to the greater abroad. So the, it, it's, there's a constant vigilance and surveillance, and that is backed up by an enormous surveillance state. And we talk about that, about that in, the, uh, in the book, that only China has these incredibly powerful technological means of uh, information control and thereby social control. And what we've seen just this last month in Shanghai is the government doing it again. No one in Shanghai, uh, who they've been under lockdown now for nearly a month. There are shortages of fresh food. It sounds like hell on earth in the, in, in the city, which is the financial and commercial capital of China, let's not forget. Mm -hmm. what, they are, what they are looking at, they are allowing people to, uh, to, to complain and to whine on social media as long as it doesn't uh, turn into a movement where people could actually start protesting or actually uh, question the, um, the, the zero COVID policy that mm -hmm. uh, Xi Jinping is imposing. So you, 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 just, you have a live experiment going on in social control at this moment in, in, in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. And what we, what, we're, what we're witnessing is this, is that in an authoritarian country where information is top down, and where control is top down, no one in China can question the fundamental policies that the Chinese government has been following for the last two years, and which frankly don't seem to be working. Or if they are working, they're coming at an incredible social and economic cost. Um, China has uh, 
you know, in the past, along with the Soviet Union, if we go back a couple of decades, they didn't used to allow their people to travel outside the country, which was even more restrictive. I think they, maybe I'm wrong, but I, I think both Russia and China allow their people to travel. So if somebody wanted to travel, and it might be shut down in their city and not able to travel for this, but in general, they can travel. So they could travel out and get outside the firewall and, and, and post things and come back. But of course, they, they would have been watched, right? Well, I look, I mean, I think, I think the other way to think about China is, uh, you know, sometimes we, we call it just-in-time censorship, or the way, they, mm -hmm. the way the Chinese government thinks about this issue. We actually talked about um, uh, the, the, a, a, um, the information policy, which was accidentally published uh, a couple of years ago that reflected China's vision of how the, the global information landscape should function and, and, and domestically as well. So China feels that the internet or Chinese leaders feel that the internet and the social media technology is an incredible boon because it allows the government to communicate with the people on a massive scale. It allows the government to monitor and surveil the communication that's happening. It's a mechanism of social control. And it also allows China to integrate into the global economy, which China, of course, is highly integrated. And that, that's, that's sort of the, and, and, they, and remember that China uniquely has its own social media platforms. It, it, you know, it's, it doesn't rely on the, you know, the kind of uh, American platforms. And in fact, it's highly critical of what they see, perceive as their hegemony. And also, uh, you know, global media of the, you know, CNN and the BBCs of the world, which they think imposes a kind of pro-Western anti-China narrative that they need to combat and compete against. So they saw a huge opportunity with, with COVID to prove that their information strategy is superior. And they, you know, in a domestic context, really tried to make the case that, look, you know, these democracies are struggling with this, you know, fake news and false information and lies. And, you know, we have the capability uniquely to ensure that the people have the information they need. This wasn't this wasn't true. This was the Chinese narrative, right. Chinese government narrative and, and their argument that they were superior had a superior system. And then they actually used Chinese propaganda to pretty effectively make the case globally. We, we, we cite a survey that was a global survey of, 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 of popular opinion in about, I think it was about the four month mark into the pandemic. And something like 60% of people around the world thought that China was doing an effective job mm -hmm. of controlling the pandemic as opposed to the United States and democracies, which they thought were doing a very poor job. There was this counter argument that authoritarian systems and authoritarian structures are more effective at managing information and therefore safeguarding public health in the context of this kind of global health emergency. In a way, that was a great thing for China because they've been pushing that narrative for a couple of decades now in other ways, uh, like with their uh, belts and roads uh, system where they build things everywhere, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, and one of the stats that you, you have uh, in your book is that freedom has gone down. I think what she said, there's, there's closed authoritarian countries, uh, electoral authoritarian countries, and then you know, mm -hmm. liberal democracies. But you said there was a switch of the freest countries from 60%, I think it was 2006 or so, to only 20%. Is the United States still in the free category? Or? Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> so... so if we're still free, that just shows what, what the definition of freedom is. So, uh, but but uh, where are the losses? The losses are being taking place in, in Africa and in Latin America, or where, where are we losing? Because I, I assume, or, or India, maybe that's a big loss, yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, the losses are global. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, um, you know, the backdrop to, to, to this book, the backdrop to the pandemic, is a shrinking of the democratic space. Mm -hmm. There's a democratic recession. I mean, we, 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 we cite the figures here that, I mean, since the, the collapse, the falling of the Berlin Wall in, in, in 1989, we, we started to see a flourishing of uh, liberal democracy in a number of countries. But uh, several organizations now that monitor this globally now say that we have lost all of those gains in the last few years. And we're back mm -hmm. to where we were 30 odd years ago. 
and something like seven out of 10 people on the planet, five and a half billion people live in countries that are not free, not fully free. Mm -hmm. So that's the backdrop against this. And what we think that one of the legacies of this, of this pandemic might be is that the measures that were introduced that we've been alluding to, whether they are emergency measures, limiting personal freedoms, limiting speech, limiting uh, the, the right to protest, some of those may persist. And they may, they may persist in countries that we, uh, we, we don't necessarily think of, like the Philippines, like mm -hmm. India, like Brazil. And one other thing that may uh, we, there may be a, a negative legacy uh, is the whole surveillance state, the mm -hmm. whole um, ability of the government to monitor the movements and the, uh, the speech and now even the health of mm -hmm. many citizens. And this is not just in China. This is, again, global, because what happened during the pandemic is that Governments introduced measures, whether they were speech limiting measures or whether they were surveillance measures, without the proper safeguards, without anchoring those uh, regulations in international human rights law or even in their own law. And it's very difficult once a freedom is taken away from you or eroded to get it back. So that, that's one of the big takeaways, I think, from this book is that we don't quite know what the, the, the extent of the negative uh, effect of this pandemic on our civil liberties will be. Yeah, you mentioned that the pandemic has brought three crises uh, right at the beginning. A public health crisis, which we all know, uh, an economic crisis, which we're all aware of, and uh, we're, we're getting another batch of that with the inflation that's going on now. And then the democratic governance crisis, which we, which we were just talking about. So it's uh, having, a, having a profound effect in many, many different ways across the board. Um, so let's talk about a couple of the other countries. Um, you mentioned Brazil. You, in your book, you, you say there's three uh, very big democratic uh, countries that are run by populists during the, the, uh, the crisis, and that's the United States, Brazil, and India. Um, and they, the United States and Brazil did something similar. One of the things I really liked that you mentioned was that, that both Brazil and the United States decided to let the states or the subunit governments make the decisions. And the reason was that way, Whatever went wrong, the feds could blame it on the states. <laughs> and if anything went right, they could say, see, we used the right strategy. So, um, you know, that's politics, but it's, uh, it's politics in a, in a crisis. So why don't you yeah. fill in some of those details? Because uh, it's interesting that Brazil followed the same pattern we did. Well, it, it is interesting. I, I, so what are, the, what are sort of the characters that we, 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 we write about in the book is the um, health minister of, of Brazil, Luis mm -hmm. Enrique Mendetta. And we, we interviewed him and profiled him. Some people call him the Fauci of Brazil. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Bolsonaro, Jair Bolsonaro, the, the president of Brazil was a sort of, you know, notorious COVID denier who downplay called it a little flu. He you know, downplayed the risk. He, you know, he, he said, you know, people are being hysterical. We need to keep the economy open. Um, and, uh, you know, and, 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 and Mendetta recognized the threat and he kind of waged this information insurgency from inside the government. He, he held a daily press briefing. He presented people with facts and the president got very annoyed with him, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, tolerated him for a period. And you'll recall that on March 8th, um, uh, President Trump hosted a meeting uh, at Mar-a-Lago uh, with uh, J J uh, Jair Bolsonaro and his uh, entourage. You may not uh, remember that it, it was a it was the um, uh, uh, birthday of um, uh, Rob. You have to help me here. Uh, 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 the, uh, um, uh, Donald Trump Jr.'s uh, girlfriend at the time. Girlfriend. Yeah. Yes, I, and they had yeah, like the a convo line. Right. Uh, and uh, like a big party, it turned into like a big super spreader event. Mm -hmm. but, uh, <laughs> that, but 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 what Mendetta noted was that he thought you know when 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 uh, Bolsonaro came back from this meeting at Mar-a-Lago, this dinner, he started implementing this strategy that was exactly like Trump's. Mm -hmm. He did three things. One is he hyped this miracle cure, hydroxychloroquine. If you thought Trump was hung up on hydroxychloroquine, it was nothing compared to Bolsonaro. He just said, you know, this is going to cure you. I'm taking it. Everyone should take it and you'll all be fine. He started blaming China the Chinese flu, you know, this is all China's fault. And he did exactly what you just described. He pushed all the decision-making down to the states. And 
uh, Mendetta thought that this was like the, the similarities were so direct that, you know, maybe they knew something that the public didn't know. Maybe they had some miracle cure or he didn't know. He thought this was really bizarre. But no, this was just a political strategy mm -hmm. intended to deflect blame, to undermine public understanding, to gain a political advantage. And if the situation this, you know, kind of uh, reckless behavior on the part of the leaders, you know, uh, uh, caused COVID, you know, the lack of, of, of a sort of effective public health strategy and, and the undermining of trust uh, in the United States accelerated the spread of the disease at the cost of hundreds of thousands of lives. There's no way to put a number on that. Mm -hmm. The impact in Brazil was even greater because institutions there are weaker. And it, you know, Mendetta was eventually fired from the government. Bolsonaro went full on in this, you know, COVID denial strategy, you know, minimizing vaccines and undermining um, a va a effective vaccine rollout. And today, Brazil's uh, democracy is is hanging by a thread. You know, another strategy that Trump employed that Bolsonaro has embraced. He's basically running around saying, "If I lose, it's because of fraud." But the difference in Brazil are his institutions are weak, um, and he's got some support from within the military, and people are very, very worried. There's a competitive election coming up in the fall, and people are very, very worried about what might happen if uh, Bolsonaro loses. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what's going on in Brazil. We think it's bad here. So <laughs> uh, now in India. Another populist, Modi, but he has other other issues, you know, that he, he also wants. It's almost like, OK, everything is upset. What can I do behind the scenes to get what I want done? You know, that's what it sounds like. And I, I know that, you know, not just political strategists, but almost all strategists, if they're in a situation where things uh, get uh, topsy turvy in some way, look to see what advantages this is for them to push forward their agenda. So what, what's going on with Modi in India? Why don't you uh, fill us in on that, Rob? Yeah, well, I mean, Modi is, is, is another populist, and there we have the world's largest democracy. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that, um, that Modi has done is exacerbate internal tensions, even before um, mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, the pandemic came along. And let's, uh, let, let's not forget the similarities. There, there was a uh, political love affair with Bolsonaro and Trump, and there was another political love affair with Modi and Trump. Uh, you remember the Howdy Modi rally uh, mm -hmm. here in the US that went on? What, what, what India did is it too pushed uh, a lot of the, um, a, a lot of the uh, uh, management of the, um, of, of the disease down to the state level. But it, again, uh, it was used as a political, uh, as, as, as a way of gaining political advantage. And you'll remember that India didn't take it seriously at the beginning, mm -hmm. didn't imp impose the kinds of uh, information flows that would be necessary for, for citizens, and then suddenly decided to lock down the country. And you had millions of uh, workers uh, who had to leave cities. They were leaving on bikes and walking. The, if they were infected, they were taking the virus with them back to their rural communities as the cities, the cities closed down. The, the idea then that, that India was doing a better job than anywhere else was rolled out, the same with vaccines. So what you have is a playbook whereby you sow confusion, you blame your political opponents uh, for uh, incompetence at the state level, and then you have these, these incredible switches back and forth where you, you're going to lock down and you're going to open up. What happens is that in the end is that ordinary citizens are totally confused. Uh, what do we? What do you do? How do you protect yourself? Um, in the end, the, uh, the 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 overriding consideration for a lot of these leaders is that they do not want to close down the economy. They did not want to take the uh, the steps that were necessary to com to prevent community spread, and they would r much prefer to say, "Look, we've kept the economy open. We're doing fine." Um, and not uh, not take the, the the necessary public health measures. India did that. Brazil's done that. Uh, Russia's done that. It, it's 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 uh, it's a common thread that runs through all the reactions of these uh, leaders. 
Um, lest, lest we feel too smug as Americans. Um, I mean, the, uh, the first, uh, one of the first things that showed that was uh, they said everybody that's abroad, Americans that are abroad, you know, stay where you are, stay where you are. And then suddenly there was a panic. Everybody come home right now uh, before all the planes shut down. So what happened? One weekend, everybody flooded all the airports. Uh, it was in March. They flooded all the airports everywhere. And, and then you had a whole bunch of people in all the airports, all of whom were traveling from other locations. Uh, kind of almost the perfect mix for, for spreading COVID rather than to say, mm -hmm. let's try to do this gradually. Uh, let's go uh, to a totally different thing, which is uh, Italy. So we had a de democracy. And Italy, unfortunately, had a very strong connection with Wuhan, an economic one, and, and, and was one of the first ones to get a, a, a base um, of the disease spreading in a Western European country. How did they do uh, in this whole process? You have a little bit about Italy in your book. Yeah. Yeah. So look, Italy was a massive warning sign because, um, you know, it was the first democracy to be completely overwhelmed uh, by the disease. And the stories that you hear from Italy, because you know what? What limited knowledge and information you know we had in the United States in the in the first wave. Italy didn't even have that level of of understanding of the disease and and and, and effective uh, public health measures. So you just you know the horror stories that you hear about uh, you know uh, uh, you know medical staff uh, uh, you know just overwhelmed patient after patient dying without being able to say goodbye to their loved ones, people locked in their homes, you know, the sirens wailing through the streets of the, you know, the first weeks of the pandemic. Um, some of these will be familiar to Americans who, who may have, you know, experienced the first wave, mm -hmm. but, you know, multiply that by, by 10 if you really want to understand the Italian experience. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one of them, I think the most important lessons, and I, I mean, I remember uh, when I was talking, I mentioned the health minister of, um, uh, of Brazil, you know, for him, he told me Italy was the wake up call mm -hmm. because he thought, in his own mind, okay, we see this outbreak in China. We see this outbreak in in Iran. Right. You know, maybe you know authoritarian countries just don't have the capacity to deal with this. But then when he saw the outbreak in Italy, he, he you know this was a democratic country, and he was like, this is coming uh, for everyone. But you know, the WHO has said that you know governments and state authorities are always overwhelmed in the first phase of a pandemic. It's, it's, mm. it's just, uh, a, a, that's the nature of it. And, the, and they don't have great information. They don't have a full understanding. Uh, and the tool that they have, the most important tool that they have is the ability to communicate and the ability to um, persuade people to change their behaviors and to have confidence in the experts. Mm -hmm. Right. And so many governments around the world, I don't think Italy, you know, Italy was not the, the best example of this, but we saw as the, as the disease spread, so many governments missed this opportunity or mm -hmm. didn't take advantage of it. Instead of trying to guide uh, and develop a public health consensus based on science and expertise, they undermined and attacked the experts and the media and the you know the doctors and you know in order to preserve some sort of uh, political advantage, mm -hmm. and so I think you know public health experts looked at Italy and they you know they they took one lesson from it, and I think many governments around the world looked at Italy and took another lesson from it, which was you know if we um, don't. Uh, gain control of the information environment and uh, so kind of suppress the kind of criticism of, our, of government action, then there's going to be a high political cost to pay. Mm -hmm. And that outlook and perspective spread along with the disease around the world. You mentioned uh, Iran at the beginning because Iran was another country that got it real quickly. Um, and, and showed the difficulty of being a theocracy because part of their solution was to, to distribute prayers that should be said against it. And that, that happened in several other more religiously inclined countries as well. Um, 
Has there been any reaction to that? Is there, or, or is it just is it accepted as part of being part of the theocracy and therefore there's, or, or, or have the people said that was a bad idea anywhere? I doubt it probably. But do you have any evidence from that? Oh, there's been, there's been lots of, of, of criticism of the way that it's handled. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the problem uh, in, in a lot of countries that are uh, as authoritarian as Iran is how do you translate that public discontent into political action? Mm -hmm. It's usually crushed. Um, mm -hmm. But Iran was a great example because, like Italy, it had uh, direct air links, even with Wuhan, which uh, continued because it, it, it served the economic and political interests of some people in power even after it was established that the, the, the virus had come from China. Iran, like a lot of uh, uh, authoritarian countries, the leadership is completely cynical about uh, the public. It's their, it's their job to keep themselves in power. Mm -hmm. And the Iranians had some anniversaries of the revolution and uh, 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 elections that were coming up that they wanted a large turnout for. So they cynically suppressed... Uh, uh, news about the, the, the virus and any public health measures that would alert the public to something that was going wrong until after that date so that the turnout would be higher, they hoped. And what that meant was that the, the virus just spread farther and farther than, than, it, it, than it needed to. And Iran had one of the worst outcomes of any country in, in the Middle East because the, th the thing was that the government spent all its time militarizing its response to a public health crisis, sending the revolutionary guards out uh, to check that people were observing quarantine or lockdown when there was, and asking them to uh, report cases of COVID so that they could go into uh, isolation. Well, that has a counter effect to what you need. People are not going to tell you if they're sick. They're not going to, they're, they're not going to disclose any information because they're afraid of the consequences. Iran is a, is, is a textbook case of how not to deal with a public health emergency in a country which before had, had done quite well at dealing with uh, epidemics um, and, and had, a, had a reasonably functioning health service, but it made a complete mess of it. You mentioned a, a real small thing there. The, the, the authoritarian is not that small, but I mean, it's one thing that you mentioned uh, was how you authoritarians take a look at things. But in a lot of countries, when you were quarantined, you said that, that people had to send in selfies to prove that they were in the right place for quarantine. And that, that was in quite a few, a wide variety of countries. So how did that work? Did that, because well, it seems like that even that's easy to get around, but... Yeah, well, one country we haven't talked about that I think is, is highly relevant that, that, that we you know, do discuss in the book is, is, is Russia. And, uh, mm -hmm. and that's a place where, where Putin saw, you know, he, he, was, he was terrified of the disease. I mean, when it first emerged, he went into seclusion. He came out of seclusion. He met with a doctor uh, in a hospital. He wore, you know, and, you know, wearing this hazmat suit. It turned out that the doctor he shook hands with, you know, was COVID positive. And so, you know, he went back into seclusion. Um, so he, but, but Putin, you know, he understood personally and, you know, took measures to protect himself uh, from the disease. But he also saw an opportunity to expand his own power and, and to use the public health uh, crisis as a pretext. So in Russia, uh, you know, just to express it in the most simple terms, there were periods where you couldn't um, engage in any sort of protest, uh, you know, that would um, challenge uh, Putin because there was a pandemic and, you know, there were restrictions on assembly. However, you know, when Putin, when the referendum was, was um, uh, uh, that would in, 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 that would allow Putin to extend his term in office was before the people in Russia. At that point, suddenly the health emergency abated and people could come into the street mm -hmm. to express their support uh, for Putin. Many of the political opponents, uh, uh, the, 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 the legal team around Alexei Navalny, some folks may remember uh, Pussy Riot, the mm -hmm. uh, punk band that, uh, you know, has, you know, has, has become a, a critical opposition force in Russia. You know, in both instances, they were subjected to public health measures, which compelled them to uh, 
stay in their homes or 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 they were basically forcibly quarantined. So political opponents of Putin were quarantined. And then the, in Moscow, they introduced um, an app. It was called Social Monitoring. And if you you had to download this on your your phone, and if you were infected, it would monitor your movements to ensure that you were quarantining. And it had this weird I don't know if it was a glitch or a or 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 a feature, but you know would wake you up every few hours and demand that you send a selfie. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know if you didn't send the selfie soon enough, the you know there might be a knock at the door. And and there were also expansions of uh, surveillance uh, using uh, surveillance technology and cameras. And if you were being quarantined and you left your house in Moscow and went into the street, you might be detected via these surveillance uh, cameras. So mm -hmm. Putin you know, saw an opportunity to expand state power under the guise of protecting public health. And he also looked around the world and he saw democracies in disarray and really struggling. And whether that, those two factors, his ability to consolidate power domestically and his perception that the, the, the West was weak and divided because of mm -hmm. the, the mishandling of the pandemic, you know, whether that factored into his decision uh, to invade Ukraine, we can't be sure, but mm. it seems uh, like that's a distinct possibility uh, given the timing. You know, a lot of people have speculated that the fact that he's kept himself away from uh, his advisors and everything has also contributed to his not getting accurate information. Um, so let's talk about some good news. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you have some winners in this uh, competition throughout the world, and uh, South Korea sounds like it comes out on top with Taiwan and Japan uh, afterwards, and then, then uh, three, I think, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand, I think, were the six examples you used. So why don't you tell about how they went about doing it? Each one was a little bit different, so it wasn't all the same. Um, what, made, what made a government a winner in this competition? Rob, you want to? Yeah, I mean, in the examples of, of South Korea and Taiwan and a few other countries in, in, in East Asia, they had already had experience with SARS and with MERS and other infractions so they had they they had a uh, they had a plan in place and what they were able to do was they reacted very very quickly uh by um using as we say in the book information to inform the public what was going on and what they were expected to do mm -hmm. to counter this uh and you know th those societies there is a perhaps a greater f uh, amount of social cohesion and certainly social conformity in uh, compared with some other countries in the West, where if citizens are told what they need to do, then they will do it. And we had m massive testing, uh, which we did not get in the West, so that people, uh, so that the authorities could see where the where the um, where the pockets of infection were and act quickly. Um, the, the surveillance, uh, was, uh, incredible. Mm -hmm. Um, it was, in, it was introduced, however, um, in a framework where the information that was taken from, from you as a citizen, there were guarantees about where it would be stored, how long it would be used and when it would be deleted, which in, is not the case in all those, all those, uh, all mm -hmm. those countries that introduced that technology. So for example, in South Korea, you could put out public information saying that a certain person that sat in a certain seat in the train uh, a car, if you were sitting in that car, you may have been infected. Now, that was very quick contact tracing. It was used positively. Mm -hmm. As long as the guarantees are there that that information, as I say, will, will be, will be uh, stored uh, and, and then destroyed and that that is communicated to the population, people will go along with that. The mm -hmm. problem is that that didn't happen in very many countries mm -hmm. and people are suspicious. And so they either and rightly didn't, so. <laughs> use, didn't use the app or they didn't divulge the information. Mm -hmm. And then the, the, whole, the whole premise for a Korean or a Taiwanese response falls mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. In the case of, in the, in the case of uh, countries like New Zealand, it was a little easier in that they are an island they were able to control access to the country. You remember that the, it's only recently that tourists have been allowed after nearly two years to return there. Mm -hmm. So they, they, they had a, 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 an advantage in their geography. But those examples, as we've, we've mentioned, of those East Asian democracies that did use um, 
use information and use surveillance, they are the exception rather than the rule. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, comparing, say, Australia and New Zealand, uh, at, at different times they've been considered highly successful, and other times, oh, that, that maybe what they did didn't work because now here's another problem or they have a bigger problem. So uh, why don't we talk about the ups and downs of their reputation? Well, I mean, I think, I think that, you know, if you look at raw numbers, I mean, they're, you know, uh, both, you know, uh, Australia and New Zealand uh, have, you know, a, a, a fraction of the deaths that, uh, you know, occurred in, for example, in this country. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, I think, I think the debate in, you know, there, there, were, there were periods in, in, in Australia, for example, because they had basically controlled the spread of the disease, it was basically virgin terrain. So there were, there were enormous concerns once, you know, you had a minor outbreak that the disease could spread like wildfire. And they were also delayed vaccinations because they didn't feel the same kind of urgency because the disease wasn't rampant. So, you know, when they had a few cases and the government, um, you know, basically imposed these really draconian lockdowns in an effort to, you know, keep the disease from spreading uh, uh, wildly. And they were, they were successful from a public health perspective. The debate in New Zealand, however, uh, and in Australia, but particularly Australia, was whether, you know, the government did impose some truly draconian measures, including, including lockdowns, including um, restrictions on movement, um, that, you know, I don't think, I think would have been really difficult to imagine, certainly in this country, where there's a much more libertarian kind of outlook and more mistrust of government. And, and that's, you know, for some, and it's justified, but it's also part of the American uh, political tradition. So it was really a question of whether the government in both New Zealand and Australia could use democratic means to forge a consensus and build support for uh, a public health response that limited deaths and infections. So neither country was perfect. I think that there was overreach certainly in Australia, certain actions that the Australian uh, uh, government took that is, you know, someone who's, who's um, dedicated to defending rights make me uncomfortable. But I think what you can acknowledge is that they were able to do something that, that in, in Australia and also in New Zealand that they were unable to do in the po populist led democracies, which was to use communication and trust and democratic means to build a public health consensus. Mm -hmm. And that is the correct response to a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And many democracies, including this one, utterly failed in that regard. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm sure that there's a similar background in Australia too to this, but you're, you talk about Taiwan, South Korea, Japan as a place where the population, if they're told what to do, they, they tend to not, they tend to cooperate more um, as, as part of the social compact of maybe high populations on small, in small areas uh, or whatever other cultural reasons there are for that. Um, but the, the word suspicion, I think, is a really crucial part here. Um, if people are suspicious of the government, and of course our, our, our generation is, was suspicious because of Vietnam, and no one, and no one's ever gotten over that, um, and, and also for good reason. <laughs> so, but, but there's also bad reasons. There's this conspiracy theory uh, you know, spread uh, that seems to be a big part of American culture. And it's not, it's not new, you know, there was the Know Nothing Party in the 1850s, and there was the John Birch Society in the 60s and 70s that thought Ike was a communist, you know, uh, and, and so on. So, so now we have that, and how do, you, how do you see that playing out as one of the crises, in, in, a, a lack, of, lack of trust, the suspicion that leads people to think everything... You can, your analysis is great because you explain what the political reasons why the governments do what they do. But the, these other explanations of why they do what they do, you know, like for Bill Gates to make more money, I, I don't understand why that's a necessary uh, reason that would inspire people to think that he's involved in that. But, but the other reasons are there and they seem to create more trust than, than the governments. 
And, and what's that going to do to us uh, going forward? What, what does your research say about that? Well, I think that what, what, what we're living in now is an age where those uh, conspiracy theories or bad information is amplified exponentially we, we you know you, you talk about you talk about the 1850s it took days to for mm -hmm. a newspaper to arrive and so now it's seconds mm -hmm. and what what we had here in, in in the u.s in particular is that it wasn't just that the underlying suspicion which is always there was was uh, was was coming out it was actively encouraged um by the political class uh, by the trump administration I mean, Trump himself went on television and, and praised uh, these quack remedies for anti-malarial drugs or drinking bleach or mm -hmm. having sunlight. I mean, he, he was actively uh, you know, pr uh, promoting these, these, these weird, weird, weird uh, responses to a public health crisis. So you're going to lose credibility as a leader on uh, whichever side of the, uh, the political divide that you are. And one of the things that we, we bring out in the book is that ordinary, good old fashioned reporting and journalism uh, wasn't there in, in, in the sufficient uh, uh, quantities or in, 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 in sufficient locations for people to be able to cut through all that noise and get basic information. Mm -hmm. So many, more than 2,000 news outlets have disappeared in the US in the last 10 years or so because they've lost their ad uh, revenue model. Google and Facebook now take all ads and uh, newspapers have withered and died. Those that are left are ghosts of them former selves. And people, as, as we point out in the book, don't consume information just on their own. They consume it as part of a community. And if you don't have a local news uh, outlet or a local newspaper, mm -hmm. you don't get that community news because those journalists that are able to work in the community are from the community. They are trusted. They know the people. So they and they will do they will do the reporting that people can trust, whether it's like, you know, uh, where do, is there a mask mandate in, in place? Why is there one? Uh, what, what measures can we take to protect ourselves? When you don't have that access at a local level from people that you can trust, you go onto the internet and Dr. Google tells you what to do, or you run to your polarized national news outlet, which is doing, uh, not serving you where you are. And we, we, we take an example in the book uh, just across the border in Mexico mm -hmm. of a newspaper called Zita, which had... Um, fantastic trust within the community, didn't trust the uh, official narrative of what was going on, so it did what all journalists do. They sent reporters out. They went to the morgue and counted bodies. They went and talked to patients. They went into hospitals, and they were able to build a picture of what was actually going on, which was different from the one that the authorities would like them to have. And so they gained the trust of their readers. So one of the unfortunate leg legacies of this pandemic and the way it's been handled is the erosion of trust in our sense-making institutions, whether it's the mainstream media, whether it's the medical institutions, whether it's government. That, that loss of trust is going to take a long time to rebuild. Yeah. Um, first, uh, congratulations on choosing an example that's so counterintuitive, you know, a, a small weekly in Tijuana uh, outdoes the, the local papers in the United States. I just, first of all, that, that was excellent choice on your part. Um, but uh, second of all, I think it's also a generational thing. I, I, it was only four or five years ago or so, but I read an essay by about a 28-year-old reporter in Los Angeles, and it was an absolutely serious essay. She was furious with her professors in college because they had told her in journalism that telling the facts, getting to the facts, that was the way to persuade people to, th that, that you have the truth. She said, that's not how it works. It's all about emotion. It's all about using fake facts or whatever facts you want to to present your point of view and persuade people. That's what persuades people. And I thought at first it was like a, a satire, but uh, no, it, it, it was true. And if, if enough journalists feel that way, um, that also is going to be a very hard thing to push back on. So yeah, go ahead, Joel. Yeah, no, I think we, we, we sort of explored that in the, in the book and we profile 
this uh, uh, former police officer, now criminology professor in Ar from Arizona called uh, Charles Loftus, who's a big Trump supporter and mm -hmm. Fox viewer. And, but, you know, but is also like a very sophisticated consumer of information, believes some, you know, kind of what we, you know, we would consider misinformation, for example, mala anti-malarial drugs or an effective treatment, mm -hmm. but also is, you know, pro-vaccine. So he's a, he's a complicated figure. He's not, you know, he's, he's impossible to caricature. And, um, and he's also kind of, a, you know, an interesting person, but to, to somebody like me who lives in, you know, uh, you know, kind of liberal bubble in New York mm -hmm. and with who, you know, interacts with like-minded people, you know, I wanted to really explore someone who had a very different perspective. And I really agree with, with Rob, you know, what I, what I came away from, from, you know, my interactions with him was, you know, he perceives and, and consumes information as part of a group, as a Trump supporter, mm -hmm. as an ex-cop, as a conservative, he sees himself within that framework. And so the information he consumes and believes and trusts is information that reaffirms that identity. So there is a kind of counter, there is a perception that I think is incorrect, that if people are presented with quote unquote the truth, then they will immediately embrace it. But yeah. human beings are much more complicated than that. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they also, uh, you know, and I, I don't, I'm not in any way suggesting that this uh, person who was learning the journalism craft and was arguing that, you know, journalists don't need to be uh, committed to the facts. Obviously, I find that um, uh, you know, just so wrongheaded. Yeah. But 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 on the flip side of that, if you're a journalist and you're writing for the public, you have to understand how complex the interaction is, um, the way people engage with the information you produce, and that's why I think the point that Rob was making about community-based media is so important and so important in a pandemic, because while this was a global event, we experienced it within communities, right? And so we needed trusted institutions within our own communities in order to help orient and guide us in our, in our response. And unfortunately, in too many instances, those were not there. Now, this isn't new. In a novel that I, I wrote uh, 40 years ago, I had one character come to a conclusion, and it was uh, two rules. There is no myth so irrational that no one will believe it. Uh, <laughs> and there is no truth so obvious that everyone will accept it. I mean, we just, we, that, that's just, we have a range, and we, we need to be persuasive. Um, and there's lots of ways to be persuasive. But I hope that the facts get, get uh, brought back in. Now, let's uh, we have a lot of questions uh, from the audience, so we'll have just a couple of minutes here to, to uh, ask them uh, and answer them. So we have one from Theodore Murray. Is this analogous to how governments handle releasing information once they are in a war? That is, the truth goes out the window? Is that, do, you, do you see it analogous to some other? Because I know that you've done work for journalists that are in trouble because of wars in other places. So you want to say that, Joel, you want to, uh, anything else other than? I think, I think Rob, do you, want to, do you want to take that one? Since you have a lot of experience in covering conflict. Yeah, I think that, look, the first thing that, that uh, in, in a war is that any, any, any government wants to be in control of the narrative because it can have uh, physical repercussions on the battlefield. So we will, we will acknowledge as journalists that there is a certain amount of military censorship that uh, we will have to abide by. We're not going to give away, you know, troop movements or whatever it is. Uh, but after that, no, the, the government government uh, is is going to be held to account the same in a war as it's going as should be held to account the same in a war as it is uh, during any other, other other crisis. Because if you don't, what we saw with this pandemic is that it becomes self-serving. It's all about maintaining the power. Of the of the government and shielding itself from uh, from criticism, and uh, we only need to look at our own experiences in the wars of the Middle East for the last twenty years, not to uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. If if it weren't for journalists risking their lives going there, telling us what's going on, we would never have found out the truth. All right, here's one, and I'm not quite sure what he's getting at, but I. Th I have a feeling I do. I'll just read it. UN charts don't condemn biological and chemical weapons against your own population and non-enemy civilians. Um, I think that that 
must be referring to the idea that this is a, that the vaccines are a biological weapon uh, against the population. I, I can't think of another reason for, for that one. So, I, I, I don't I don't quite uh, understand uh, that question, but yeah. you know, it just is a, a, a reminder again that you know there's a lot of very strange ideas out there, and mm -hmm. some of that is a function of fear. And rumors, you know, that, that, you know, I mean, the, the rumors and fear and confusion, those are are um, expected in a, in, a, in a pandemic. They're not unusual. And it's really uh, and the way that governments can combat them. And you're never going to have a perfect record. You're never going to convince everyone. But again, it's about it's about using the democratic uh, tools that you have at your disposal to build a consensus is by acknowledging that people are afraid and be sending out a consistent message and being honest with people as information changes. Does that, des does that describe the way uh, the, the federal government in the United States responded to this pandemic? I think everyone will agree, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. So the response of people in terms of being afraid and in terms of being vulnerable to misinformation and lies, that's a normal response in a pandemic. What's not normal is that the government and the authorities don't use um, me the means at their disposal, i.e. Uh, uh, recognizing and building up confidence in trusted institutions. Uh, in, our, in our case, in this country, they undermine and sabotage that process and I think that led to, um, you know, a, a terrible consequences for our democracy, but also terrible public health outcomes. Uh, the next question is kind of right in line with that. And he mentions that the failure is one of not knowing the one's style of political economy, um, following an austerity design rather than an abundance design. That is, you know, that we're, we're actually living in abundance rather than austerity. And so why did we, why did we use austerity as the means to shut everything down. But uh, on the other hand, in, in your studies, did you find any place that, you know, that worked well without trying to shut everything down, basically? Not, not shut everything down, but, but did, any, did any place try to keep things as normal as possible and remain unaffected? Well, a country's tried to at the beginning. You'll remember mm -hmm. the, the response of Denmark and Sweden and, and the UK at one mm -hmm. point. Yeah, uh, look, the politicians tried to have their cake and eat it. They wanted to keep the economy open. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but the whole point of the book is that the debate didn't take place because the information was either undermined or withheld. Mm -hmm. um, did we have a debate about school closures? No. Did we have a debate about um, lockdowns? No, it was either not done in the name of keeping the economy open or it was imposed and the, 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 the debate was shut down. As Joel says, in order, for, in order for this to work, you need information to build trust and citizens have to believe that they have had some input into whatever it is that the government is asking them to do. If, if, if you as a citizen believe that you, you've been heard, even if you're not agreed with, and that you, there is a rational explanation which is being given to you without talking down to you or without playing on your fears, you're more likely to comply with the public health uh, measures that, that, that are required of you, whether it's uh, not being able to go to work, whether having to sit in your apartment for a month, or whether to have to wear a mask. But if that information isn't given to you, if that debate can't take place, then you will either resist and the whole thing about public health measures becomes uh, a politicized as it was here in the States, mm -hmm. or you get these incredible shifts. Like you, you, you heard the, the, the British government saying, oh, well, we'll go for herd immunity at the beginning. And then that was nonsense. And then they had a severe lockdown. And I don't think if you look at the, the record of some of the Scandinavian countries that in the end they came out any better uh, for, the, for their approach than say um, some of the other countries in the EU, their neighbors like, like Germany or France. Mm -hmm. All right, well, the last question is from Theodore Murray, and it's much on this point. Uh, Dr. Burke said on Tuesday, a way to handle a future pandemic in a better way would be to accurately inform the citizens, and they would be able to make good decisions to protect themselves. Comments, okay? So that's a little bit further afield than what you're, you're, you're saying. So, uh, no, I, 
I, I think, I mean, I, look, I think the, the point of this book is that information uh, is, is the most important and credibility and trust mm -hmm. is the more than, you know, medical interventions or anything else at the onset of a pandemic, you know, that's what governments have at their disposal. That's the most important tool. Part of it, what they could do with that tool is to inform the public so that people can make their own decisions. On the other hand, public health emergencies require collective action. Mm -hmm. We can't just all act as individuals in a public health emergency. We have to change our own behavior in order to protect the health of others. The most effective way to get people to do that, certainly in a democracy, and it should be an advantage in a democracy, is to use persuasion to communicate effectively mm -hmm. and to activate the trusted institutions and the sense-making institutions. And that is the, the most effective response. And so many democratic countries around the world failed. It's not totally surprising that authoritarian countries failed mm -hmm. um, because they, they sought to um, uh, you know, um, uh, suppress information that was threatening to them because that's what they do. But it is a tragedy of the pandemic that so many democratic governments, including our own, so failed so terribly. And I think that the, the failure had not only public health consequences, but geopolitical consequences that have shifted the balance of power in profound ways and also undermined uh, rights and accelerated the democratic recession that we referenced earlier. Mm -hmm. So we have our work cut out for us uh, in the post-pandemic world. It's, a, it's an incredibly challenging um, world that we've emerged into, and it's exciting to a certain extent, you know, that the, that we seem to, we're not through the pandemic yet, mm -hmm. and, 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 and we may never fully, you know, uh, go back to where we were, but we also have additional work to do, which is to rebuild, uh, you know, the, 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 the essential institutions that ensure accountability in a democratic society. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so that, that, I think, is another legacy of the pandemic. That's extremely well said and extremely important. I, I mean, I agree with you, because if we don't get back this persuasion uh, with information and so on, it's uh, understandable, as you said, that a government's going to react with a knee jerk, let's confuse everybody and, and cause, so that we don't get blamed for this because it's too big a problem. But that was the reason why people had plans in place, right? And uh, we didn't use ours, but, uh, but the other countries did, and it worked. Let's get those plans back in place and get the institutions uh, to, to be persuasive. It's almost like uh, we don't torture anybody, but as soon as we feel like we have to torture somebody, we go ahead. You know, you, you have these rules in place so that you, when the time comes, you have something to rely on and to persuade people. Well, everybody has been saying we shouldn't do this. Let's not do this. Let's try to do it this democratic way. But... We're only 400 years into using democracy, so maybe we're still too naive about it. <laughs> well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Uh, great book, great yeah. analysis of what went on in all the different countries besides the big issue about how governments use uh, this form of propaganda using noise, uh, confusion, uh, to, to, to create lies and make us all a little bit sicker, as you said in your title. Thank you very much. Uh, so Rob Mahoney, Meany, and uh, Joel, uh, thank you very much. And uh, next time you do something like this, let us know. We'll do another one. Thank you very much thank for joining us. So it's another event at the Commonwealth Club in its 120th year of enlightened discussion. I hope you learned something from that. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>